Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the gift of faith and all the wonderful gifts that you have bestowed upon us. Help us, help us to realize that in the midst of this world that we are loved by you and that we can share all these wonderful gifts that you have given to us to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're in 1 Corinthians. Okay. And last week we set up a, a little bit of a theory of the freedom that God gives to us. We're in Christ. We know we're forgiven. We have that freedom. Paul's going to articulate that freedom a little bit more. We had some issues in which we were going to discuss this freedom, but first of all, we need to realize that all things belong to God. Oh, and by the way, you also belong to God through holy baptism. So this is a good thing. Uh, one of the situations they had a problem with was eating in the temple, okay? Not in their temple, but in quote-unquote temples of other quote gods because um, A, there is only one God but one. So for a Christian, we do not recognize there are other gods in this world. They have no power, okay? We recognize there's only one who is all-powerful, and that is the Almighty God, so we don't necessarily worry about any other lesser spiritual beings, if I could just put it that way. Instead, we put our faith and trust in the Almighty God. So if other people are sacrificing meat to some character that they have imagined or heard about or whatever, uh, and it's discounted, hey, hey, it's on sale. What's wrong with a good sale? Okay. And so Paul is basically saying, yes. However, there was a little bit of a, an asterisk to that line of thought. The asterisk to that line of thought said, you know, if somebody is coming from that pre faith tradition and is brand new to Christianity and is really struggling with it, don't invite them going out to lunch to that temple for lunch, you know? It's, it's called just be sensitive to where they are, continue to teach them about Jesus Christ and continue to work with them. We had that as one of our Christian customs of why ham was then served on Easter. You would have a lot of Jewish converts. They would be baptized on the Easter vigil. They would receive the Lord's Supper on Easter. And then after the Lord's Supper, you could come home and enjoy your ham. But if some would have said, you know, I don't know if I'm quite ready for ham, that's okay. You still have the freedom in Christ. You're still forgiven. Enjoy that freedom, okay? But don't let's not get legalistic about it. So now Paul is going to, we're going to move into this next section. Uh, Paul's going to give some more examples of this. And Paul's going to emphasize the love of others shown by Paul. Uh, and he's going to... Um, continue this idea of freedom. And so when we get into chapter 9, he's going to hit that concept really, really hard. And again, freedom means freedom in Christ. Okay? You're in Christ, it's good. You're outside of Christ, it's bad. So if it's good, enjoy what God has given you. So with that in mind, let's dive into from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Paul writes, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So there's a few things going on in the back of Paul's mind here. First of all, um, a little bit of disruption and that disruption looks like this there were some that did not like what paul was saying and teaching and were sort of creating a little bit of havoc and so paul is basically um saying am i not an apostle okay an apostle means sent by our lord and savior jesus christ so have i not seen jesus the answer is yes on the way to damascus you may remember and so he's basically saying, yeah, I'm an apostle. Everyone knows it, okay? Um, and then talks about the workmanship. So he realizes that he's proclaimed that gospel. People heard that gospel. 
and you get the proof of that proclamation of the gospel by you see by seeing other Christians uh, flourishing in the Christian faith. And so he then uh, has that argument and says, you know, I am, an, I am apostle, you know, you are the seal of my apostleship. So again, it's, it's a little bit of damage control, you could say, because people were attacking uh, Paul behind the scenes. But now I want to bring in, this is not Luther, this is a, a Lutheran commentary uh, the author is from, is called, the last name is Lenski, but let me just read what he has to write, what he wrote. Paul has just said that he would not eat meat at all if such eating would really scandalize any one of his brethren. That was last week's lesson. In close connection of thought, he now asks, am I not free? He is, he surely is. And not only objectively, but also subjectively, as far as his own conscience is concerned, free so that no man may dare dictate to him. And yet, see the restriction he is already he is he is ready to place on himself. The second question emphasizes the first: Am I not an apostle? Certainly, as an apostle who is sent to proclaim the liberty in Christ Jesus is free. He, and himself possesses this liberty most freely. So again, at the heart of this is the whole concept of liberty, okay? But yet we don't necessarily use our liberty to spiritually blackmail other people or lead them down the wrong path, okay? So we want to use our, liber our Christian liberty appropriately, okay? And so that's why uh, Paul is um, uh, saying uh, what he is, and Lenski picks up on that. Yes, Hilda. Do you think they understood that what he meant by am I not free is the way I'm interpreting is that he was free spiritually. Yes. Okay. But perhaps they didn't understand that concept. When, Correct. If he said, I am not free, I mean, obviously Paul was had been incarcerated, maybe not at this point, right. but he was incarcerated. There were mm -hmm. things he couldn't do. He couldn't go, and he was told not to profess Christ. That's not freedom. Yes, he, he, you're right. He he was free spiritually, like you, you picked up on that idea. He had the forgiveness of sins. He's in Christ. It's all good. But you're right. There were some times in his life he was imprisoned, and there were some times he was forced out of a town. Uh, so, yes, uh, what we perceive as freedoms like we enjoy in this country, uh, Paul didn't necessarily had, but he understood his freedom in Christ and the forgiveness of sins and that uh, God is uh, working through him and this is a wonderful blessing. He's going to go into a little bit more details about that, so uh, I'm glad you're, you're on that right path there. Um, so let, let me, let's go back to Paul. Um, and uh, see how he's going to unpack this a little bit more. He said, verse 3, This is my defense to those who would examine me, referring to those who are kind of questioning who he is and his authority. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and brothers of our Lord and Cephas? Oh, now Cephas is Peter. But let's unpack this for a little bit. Uh, and let me use, instead of apostles, let me use pastors for a moment and just have a little bit of fun with that. Uh, we, we talked about this, uh, I think, either last week or the week before, you know, or maybe it was a couple weeks ago, sorry. Um, should a pastor be married? Mm -hmm. Make your life more fulfilling, I think. Uh, there are certain advantages, but there are certain disadvantages. The family requires time, right, and resources. And so is it fair to say the church is better served by a pastor who can dedicate his life fully to the church? Not if he's unhappy with it. Okay, that's exactly where Paul was leading us in basically saying, you know, if you're going to burn, get married, okay? Okay. Uh, but then would that disqualify you from being a pastor? It shouldn't. It shouldn't. Because right now in the Roman Catholic Church, you have uh, uh, your holy orders being given to priests who are celibate. 
uh, with some minor exceptions, okay? And, you know, the, the church is served well under most circumstances by people who are able to dedicate more time to the church. However, Paul is also begging the question and saying, because apparently we're going to assume he would be arriving on the scene without a wife, whether he had a wife earlier or not, that's up for debate. Um, and so some people were kind of, you know, taking advantage of that situation. Uh, they weren't paying him at all, so to speak. He was working along the, that way. And so now he's just asking the question in the freedom aspect. Is it right that we, that I can take a wife with me? Others have done it. Why can't I? Okay, and that's what he's articulating in the back of his, uh, his mind here. Um, and he's going to add that a little bit more. But now let me share with you um, a story that comes from uh, that last retreat I was on. I was talking to another pastor and his wife, and we were kind of sharing and swapping stories. And she had a very interesting one. They graduated, she, he graduated from seminary, they arrive at the very first parish, you know, it's all good. And somebody comes up to her and says, you know, we were expecting our pastor to be single. Oh, wow. Hmm. Why? Because it's cheaper. Oh my gosh, it's cheaper. Really? Yeah, that was kind of her comment also, like, you're, you're saying that to me, his wife, okay? And yeah, she was... Things did not go well, let's just put it that way. But it goes back to the concept of the freedom is, as a pastor, am I not free to have a wife and children and still serve our Lord uh, in this uh, ministry? Uh, some people would say yes, and some people apparently have said no. And the people in Corinth of the Corinth were struggling with that, is, okay, so you're in Christ, do we not have that freedom? Or are we now going to get very real legalistic? And that's one of the things I, that drives me nuts is when we have all these rules and expectations, because even in my alma mater from seminary way back decades ago, many decades ago, since I've just celebrated three decades of my ordination, uh, you had the expectation that um, if you were married, you couldn't go to that seminary and you couldn't get engaged into your fourth year, and then the expectation is by the time you arrived in your first parish, you better be married soon after. Those are all man-made rules there, God's rules. Thank you, thank you. Uh, again, that puts us on the right perspective. Uh, these were rules designed by, or expectations set by man, not by God. And Paul would say, wait a minute, this is my freedom. So when I went to seminary, neither seminary had a single requirement. Uh, you could be married at either seminary. But uh, for the longest time, our church body held a second seminary for those who were second career and married, whereas those who were single could, of course, dedicate more time and opportunity to studying. Fair enough. That was uh, my alma mater. So anyway, uh, so am I not free to be married? Uh, am I not free to eat or drink? Uh, if I choose to have a vegetarian diet, I do not. Uh, can I ha not enjoy that freedom? Okay, and the answer is yes. So let's continue on. Verse 6. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Now, here's an interesting part. Uh, Paul was very much what we would call a worker priest. He was working, he was earning his own living, but he was also serving the church. Nothing wrong with that. However, can should the church expect that of its pastors? That's the interesting part. Going to, back to that example uh, from um, that I heard from that one spiritual treat, would they expect the pastor to sit there and say, we're going to call you to this location. We want you to serve as our pastor. We have all these expectations for you. And by the way, one of the other expectations is that you get a job, 
and you make your money from that job and receive all your benefits from that job and you just do this Free. volunteer. <laughs> Whoa, that's a lot of work. Okay. Uh, and Paul is basically saying, uh, wait a minute, if I'm doing this work, should I also not receive some of the benefit of that work? Okay. In the Old Testament, the priests were always took a part of the offerings. The, pri the priests yes. always took part of the offerings. Actually, yes, the offerings um, were, um, that's how the, the Levites um, sustained themselves. They were not assigned property in the promised land. They were not given a land. Their means of supporting their family came from the sacrifices at the temple. Hmm, but Paul has more to say. Verse 8, do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Paul then writes, is it for oxen that God is concerned? Ooh, notice a little bit of sarcasm in there, okay? Is God concerned about the ox? Well, yes. Is he not more concerned about people? Again, yes. And so um, and I'm not going to discount uh, animals. I don't want a whole bunch of ox sending me nasty uh, <laughs> emails and saying, uh, you just discounted us, okay? No, I instead I want to sit there and say they are God's creation. God is concerned about them. But who is the most important part of God's creation? Humanity. Humanity. Notice God specifically took dust, that'll be definitely next week's lesson, and breathed into that dust his breath for life to that dust. Completely different than any other animal on how they were created on earth. God set apart humanity for a reason. Okay, so God is concerned about people. And so just as you don't muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, you got that command? Um, Paul is basically saying, okay, you got to treat your workers well. But now let's uh, continue on. Verse uh, 10. Does he not certainly speak for our own, our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap a material thing, things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we have endured rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. So Paul names a couple things. First of all, others have said, hey, we're proclaiming Christ among you. You need to help us out. Nothing wrong with that. But don't discount Paul's message just because he did not have uh, a cost and he did not reap a harvest. He was earning his own way and that's what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. And that's what we have to understand as we're going through all of this. If Paul has the ability to be that worker priest and it's working well with him, awesome but others also uh, do, did not have that ability and that's fine also so don't sit the church should, should not necessarily be expecting uh people to be working and putting in so many hours that family and life are neglected all for the sake of the gospel okay uh so he's going to continue on with this thought and says verse 13 do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? We were talking about that before with the Levites. And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Okay, so Paul's going to spell it out after he's already been leading everyone up to this point. But now he's going to go on and says, But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any provision. I would rather die 
than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. Okay, so Paul was basically saying, yeah, he's he's arriving on site and he does this throughout his ministry um, to proclaim the gospel and he's not going to charge anyone anything. So a truism, uh, something that I spoke, various words. This was so very, very true a long time ago. Uh, we're talking mm, two and a half decades ago. Okay. Uh, I'm in a, a Bible class. Uh, it was not part of the church that I was at. I was at. Uh, I was actually working at a hospital at the time, doing my residency, and so I was hanging out at what the local Lutheran church and attending one of their at-home Bible studies. And the question that was on the the topic for discussion purposes to help lead into the Bible study is: What would you do with if somebody gifted you with two million dollars? Again, this is a couple of decades ago, so for inflation purposes, well, let's just say $5 million. Uh, my response immediately would be, was to invest the money so I could live off the interest, so I could serve a congregation who could not afford to have me. That picks up very much what Paul was talking about. And in this Bible study, I had my wife alongside of me. So everyone would know, no, I had a family. And the other thing was, it was a Bible study that my in-laws were attending. So of course they knew I wanted to take care of my, my wife, their daughter, and uh, the family that God would eventually entrust to our care. Uh, but yet at the same time, uh, my love for proclaiming Christ uh, was there. And regardless of how much money I would make, just as long as my family was taken care of and they weren't uh, deprived and starving. Paul was operating under a very similar type of thing. Um, and again, we're thinking he was single, okay? Uh, that he probably did get married and then maybe his wife died or divorced or didn't travel with him, we don't know. Uh, but he was operating under very low expenses. He could make his living uh, not off the gospel, but by tent making. Um, and so he's like, no, I didn't charge you guys. Okay, I didn't expect that, nor do I expect it now. That's also what he's asking in this. Uh, why? He enjoyed that idea going, hey, I'm not charging for this because if I'm charging for it, and here's the thing, some people would say he's only saying that so he can make more money. He's only appealing to what the crowds want him to say. And he wants to avoid that. So this is, this is Paul's little niche. And I don't want to take Paul's niche away from him. Likewise, I also don't want the church to sit there and say, this is now expected of all our pastors. See, Paul did it. But Paul also named others didn't. Jesus didn't. Huh? Jesus didn't take money. Jesus didn't take money. Okay. For himself. For himself. Thank you for that clarification. You're right, I didn't see him ever passing a collection plate, but somewhere down the line, Judas was holding a money bag. And so obviously there had to be some exchange of money here and there to buy certain provisions. And the Bible does not necessarily tell us how Jesus acquired that. Uh, the only per, uh, way of money that is actually acquired is when Peter had to pay the temple tax and Jesus sent him off fishing and then take the coin from the fish's mouth, uh, which is one of those interesting little miracles there. Uh, so, benefactors. Huh? We had benefactors. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Jesus does realize that we live in this world. There's an economy. We have to operate in this world. Uh, but to keep our focus upon the gospel. But let's go on to uh, with Paul, I mean, uh, yeah, with Paul here, because I'm leaving you at a little bit of a conundrum with the last phrase. No one de deprived me of the, gr the ground of my boasting. Is he boasting? I'm leaving you, let's go into the next phrase, because then we'll find out about this boasting. Verse 16, for if I preach the gospel... That gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, but if I do it of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, 
I am still entrusted with a stewardship. Okay, so here Paul seems to be talking out of both ends of his mouth. He's basically saying, yes, I am making my own way and paying my own way through most of my ministry. Uh, and he's charged by Christ to go ahead and do that. Uh, he has no choice. That's that woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Um, and he says, I do this of my own reward, uh, of my own will. I have a reward. But even if I don't do this of my own will, uh, I'm still entrusted with a, a stewardship. Again, he's, he's not condemning those that do need to make their living off the gospel. He's just utilizing his freedom. He doesn't have to, uh, to um, uh, again, to uh, serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, now, you gotta, now, let me just interject one other interesting thought here. Have you ever seen people say, give something to the church, okay? And then sit there and say, because I gave this to the church, you need to do such and such, such and such, and such and such. There's strings attached. There's, thank you, there's strings attached. Okay, we live in a world where that's how a lot of people operate outside the church. Okay, you know, in the business community, you know, you you have companies working together and there are various negotiations, various strings attached. Okay, in the church, should it be that way? The answer is no. But I realize I'm working and shepherding people who are used to that way of doing things in today's world. And so, yes, it creeps into the church. Um, this is where we practice that love, we practice that forgiveness, um, and we realize that, uh, again, as I mentioned before we started, uh, that God has given us each different gifts. And so, uh, you know, sometimes I need to listen to what other people have to say and say, you know, you do make a good point, maybe we should be doing this. Uh, but yet at the same time, uh, our decision making should always be what's best for the church, not just what's best for one individual. But again, uh, that's where the, the church needs to come in and sit there and say, uh, and understand what's going on and to make decisions appropriately. But let's get back to um, uh, Paul. He's going to finish up this idea here. Uh, what then is my reward? that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, as so not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So Paul is saying he is different. Strangely enough, there may come a time for the church to have more and more, and then we're actually in this time, part-time pastoral care. Okay, uh, this, this is actually even being discussed in our seminaries right now. Okay, can the church always continue to afford full-time pastoral care? When I was at seminary, we never discussed that. And then I found myself in that um, situation, uh, wishing that we at least had the, those discussions at a seminary background. Um, but now those discussions are happening at the seminary. Uh, so, um, yeah, there may come a time for that past part-time pastoral care uh, is all that the church can afford. But that decision uh, should be carefully um, and very deliberately uh, in co-op and discussion with the pastor and the leaders uh, for that decision to take place, okay? It's not just because one person says so, uh, it's because this is the church we have gathered together, we've talked about it, we've assess the situation and we've said this is what probably needs to happen for us to continue to move in the future yes hilda uh one thing i've noticed since i've been here uh, just maybe about over a little over two mm -hmm. years and my lifetime in the catholic church is there i would we, they would frequently be asking for money uh, in at the pulpit mm -hmm. uh, i have never once heard you do that <laughs> Ah, that, that's, a, that's a very true statement. Um, how's the best way for me to describe it? Uh, 
you're you're right i i'm actually a, i'm allowing uh people's expectations to somewhat guide my sermons and so some people have the expectation is that the church just continues to preach about money okay uh and it's not about money per se uh, and here's the other, th I see, I would like to get away from that concept that it's about money, except for we got to pay the light bills, we got to maintain the building, uh, there are other expenses, um, including the pastor's salary. Uh, but a better discussion would be that we realize that everything we see, all that we are, all that we have, are gifts from God. It's not really any of us as an individual. It is God's, okay? God own, owns everything. This is his universe, okay? So all that we should do is to give glory to God. And yes, God gives us many gifts, and there's nothing wrong with us enjoying these gifts and utilizing these gifts. But yet at the same time, God has also given us uh, the gift of that faith, uh, the gift of the gospel, and that word needs to be continued to be taught and proclaimed among us. And how is that going to happen? God's going to call people to do it. But yet, then the church also needs to support that, not only in training people and making sure that they're properly educated and they're on the right path, but also to support them and their families uh, in that ministry. So you're right. Um, Actually, during my uh, doxology conferences, uh, the topic of stewardship came up. And I'm still trying to figure out, uh, I have an idea of how um, we, I need to be a little bit more intentional to be teaching this biblical model of uh, what, that all of this is God's. And how do Christians um, receive the blessings from God and share the blessings of God uh, appropriately, not just with the church, but even with one another uh, and give of themselves. And again, it's uh, I'm still digesting uh, some of that material and uh, I've got a, a resource that I'm probably gonna follow up on, but thank you for reminding me I haven't yet followed up on it. So thank you, Hilda, for bringing that up. But you are 100% correct. Um, I, in my preaching, I have not necessarily preached money from the pulpit per se so you're telling me i should no <laughs> no i mean but uh i, I guess that from growing up uh -huh. we always gave in the basket you know as, right. as a younger yes. person we always gave in the basket my concern is that now to make life easier people will take electronically and maybe just give just give to the church that way and uh but our children, my grandchildren, mm -hmm. don't ever see the money being given from their families to the church because it's done electronically. And and if you watch your granddaughter or grandson, they're sometimes charged with putting something in the offering plate as they come up for communion they give blessing. Them the money. Oh, you give them the money? I give them the money. Oh, you give them the money. Okay, good, good. See, that's a good way of teaching that. Yeah, that's, that's my that's my that's my thought. Because because if the parents aren't doing it, they're gonna think that you can just go to church and not never not ever give anything. Correct. Okay. That it's free of charge. And yes, it's free to get God's word in a way, but yet to keep it going, like you said, you gotta pay the rent, you gotta pay uh, the lights, you gotta maintain People have to live and eat and drink, and right. um, there's expenses to it. Who's going to pay for it? And if the children grow up, my grandchildren growing up, never see, even though I know that my family gives, but if they don't actually see it physically, they are not told by their parents what that they give every month, even though they don't see it. They can, they're, they're, they may grow up thinking that they don't ever have to give anything. And that's a very good teaching point. You're right. We do need to teach our children. And in exactly that same discussion you just had, I would encourage you to teach to children and grandchildren. 
uh, because that's how they're going to learn. And now it's always nice when they see that modeled and that would make a good case to go back to uh, having offering plates and having ushers, you know, pass that plate. However, uh, for other various reasons uh, in our society, you're right, they're going, I actually know of a lot of churches that are moving to, they have a little kiosk in the narthex area. You just sort of put in your credit card, you type in the amount that you want, and it comes through, and you get a little piece of paper, and... Your receipt. Huh? Your receipt. Yeah, you get your receipt. Um, and actually, I know of a Lutheran pastor who was, who was in a church that had one of these kiosks, and he would take his confirmation class over to the kiosk and demonstrate how to do that. But they were learning. They were learning. You're right. That's part of the reason why he was trying to teach that stewardship part. Uh, we don't have a kiosk uh, in our narthex. We're a little bit of a smaller congregation. That congregation I'm thinking of was a little a lot bigger than us. Uh, but yet at the same time, we still need to do that teaching. So thank you for reminding me. Yes, Pastor, don't give up on that teaching. Uh, because it needs to be taught. Okay. Do they do an offering in Sunday school? Uh, yes, there is an offering in Sunday school. Well, then that's good. And that, that's helping. Yes, well, that we is helping. Had Sunday school in a while. Well, yeah, during the summertime, summer we don't have Sunday yeah. school, but it starts up uh, after Labor Day. Right. Yeah. And you don't okay, so. Church, do they? Huh? Hey, do they have Sunday school in the Catholic Church? No. Yes. No. I don't yes. think so. They do? They do. Sunday school? Yes. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll just say some churches do, maybe some don't. No, okay. Do they have it well, because uh, they, have, they have several services. So usually it's at the 930 service, all the kids, they come in with their parents, and then in part of the service, they go off oh, to yeah. another room, and they have their Sunday school there, and then when they're through, they come back in time for, you know, when the parents are taking communion. Okay. Yes. Churches do that. In the past in our congregation, mm -hmm. And we've been here for, what, 30 years? 40. 40 years. <laughs> that goes we have never had a pastor that asked for money from the pulpit. But we have had individual members get up and make presentations mm -hmm. to the congregation, letting them know this is a need, how much money it is, Here's our goal, come and help. And that's never failed. That's how awesome. they the Catholic Church. It's an elder you, or a deacon or that. somebody. Yeah. You've done that. I've done that in years. Yeah. And, and what I appreciate about that is, again, it um, takes the, the, the people who are critics and saying the church is always asking for money and at least pulling it off of the responsibility of the pastor and putting it on the lay people and saying, hey, this is our church, our community, we need to support it. That's uh, the way it should be. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're right. Uh, and that's also part of the reasons why I have a heart when people sit there and saying, okay, are you gonna do a stewardship sermon? It's just like, I don't know if that's accomplishing everything you wanted to accomplish, especially if you had a particular project in mind. That takes the pressure off your back. Well, yeah, but at the same time, um, we also need to face realities of who we are. And so we do need to have these uh, discussions and teaching opportunities. And I will admit, the Sunday morning or Saturday evening service, that's where your congregation is gathering in, in the mo at the most. You know, if we do voters meetings, you get a subset of that regular attenders. Even for Bible class, you get a subset. Uh, so if you're wanting the whole group to be uh, educated, um, it needs to be prime time, so to speak. But let me uh, move on and try to finish up here with uh, chapter 9. I don't know if I'm going to make it, but we'll see. Verse 19, for though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though um, not being under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. He's going to continue on with this line of thought, so let me just continue, and then we'll back up a little bit. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, 
that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Okay, so when Paul is saying, you know, I, I become all things to all people, okay, he's basically putting himself in a servant role and saying, I'm serving people wherever they are. If they're weak, uh, I, I be, appear weak. If they're under the law, I put myself under the law, even though I'm free from the law, but I will put myself under the law because that's where they're at. And I love that approach by saying, I'm gonna go with where they're at and try to teach them Christ where they're at. And that goes back to, if I can go back to that uh, food sacrifice to idols. And somebody who just came, let me just make up this example. Uh, somebody who just came from being a follower of Zeus, okay, and is now coming to the Christian church, you're not gonna take this brand new convert to Christianity and say, let's go back to that Zeus temple and have lunch. Again, you're trying to nurture that faith. And you're trying to, so if the person is still struggling with all these things uh, and the offering of meat to idols, okay, then I'm not gonna eat that meat for a while. Let's dialogue, let's talk, let's build you up a little bit more in Christ. And then maybe one of these times we could have a, a lunch at the Zeus temple, so to speak, when you're ready, if you're ever ready. And just leave that out there. But again, you're still working with the individual where the individual is at. Um, and so Paul was be being very, very conscious of where people are at spiritually so that he doesn't disrupt the, the work of the gospel that was already being done. So that's basically for, non, for non-believers. Um, as they're making their convert to Christianity, correct? Because as they are being converted and they're being instructed in the faith, you're expecting some progress, okay? Um, and I will admit for each individual, it might be a little bit challenging. There might be some stumbling blocks that they're really having a hard time getting over, but they're, you're expecting them to continue to grow in Christ. And that's actually a lead into the next section. So let me just pick it up. Verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now, there's a lot of ways of looking at this uh, Bible passage, but uh, let's look at it, first of all, within the theme that Paul is presenting. He's presenting uh, the theme of um, young Christians, so to speak, making that convert to Christianity, trying not to offend them, but to work with where they are. But at the same time, he's like, you're not going to stay there either. You're going to discipline your body. You're going to continue to grow in that Christian faith and have more confidence in Christ. Okay, so he's going to use this runner's analogy, which I, I do have a, a, a certain attachment to since I do run. Uh, and guess what? It takes discipline. In the Christian faith, does it not take discipline to sit there and say, yes, I will pray. Yes, I will read God's word. Yes, I will go to church. Okay, and not just once in a while, but on a regular basis, because it's important. I can't sit there and say, you know, I have plans, and this is true, uh, for next fall to run another marathon, okay? And it's not like uh, I have the plans and then I won't run at all until the day before the race just to practice. <laughs> no, I'm gonna fail miserably. Guess what? I need to, since I'm at my age 
and uh, not as in good shape as I want to be. I'm watching kind of an injury so I don't have to re-injure myself. So I need to take things slowly and to plan appropriately. And I got pretty much a good plan in place and to achieve that goal, but it's going to be step by step to kind of make it to that goal. Um, kept having that goal and many things kept interrupting that goal. But this time I'm like, let's try to manage all the interruptions here. But it does take discipline. And Paul is using that even for these early converts to Christianity and saying, wait a minute, we got to remember it's God's word that strengthens us. So you just came from the temple of Zeus. Okay, great. You now believe and trust in Jesus Christ. Great. Um, you're going to continue to grow. You're going to continue to attach yourselves to God's word. We're not going to get caught up in legalism here. Instead, we're going to understand our freedom, but then don't take your freedom to neglect that Christian faith. Because am I free to neglect the Christian faith? Yes. Yeah. Am I free not to put anything in the offering plate? Yes. Am I free to avoid the Bible and avoid God's word and so forth down the line? Unfortunately, yes. But then what's going to happen? I may fall away from the Christian faith. So that's why he says, you're going to, you're basically running a race. You're, you're trying to obtain the prize, one that's imperishable. So don't run aimlessly. Don't box beating the air, so to speak, but discipline the body, put it under control, focus on Christ, and let's uh, move forward with all of that. Uh, because it, it, now there's another interesting nuance here that I want to bring up here. And that is, Paul is using a very physical analogy of a, a runner running a race. And he's using it in a spiritual context. Okay? We need to realize as Christians that we are created by God, body, body and soul. So does God want us to take care of the soul? You're going to hear more about that uh, this weekend's uh, sermon. Does God also want us to take care of the body? The answer again is yes. So I just want to pop to Genesis and just focus again on when God created Adam from Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So notice we have a body and a soul, okay? The soul comes in as God is breathing into us the breath of life. Question, which one was created first? Doesn't the scripture say it's spirit? It doesn't say soul. Um, we can, we can do a little bit of, uh, discussion on the differences between, uh, spirit and soul. Uh, but let's just lump that into the breath of God for right now and not split that hair at the moment, because I am trying to make my, uh, a point here, which was created first. Body. The body. The body. Dust from the ground. Dust. Right. Uh, because now there is a line of thought out there in Christianity that will talk about and actually, I'm not too sure if it's really of Christianity or if it comes from another place and introduced itself into Christianity, where the idea is that souls are, were all created at the early part of creation, and then God assigns a body as the bodies come into uh, production, so to speak. No. You're right. I, I also cringe at that line of thought. Okay. Uh, and so, but notice what happens here in Genesis. God is very specific. He created man from the dust of the earth, and then he breathed. Okay. So, again, I'm going to look at this the way that I think Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 looks at it. I see the body, and then the breath. If you're following the daily devotions, guess what? Oh, I can't remember if it's today or tomorrow. One of these days soon, and if we haven't covered it already, uh, the Valley of Dry Bones. Mm -hmm. Guess what? You had dry bones. Life. You had the prophecy. 
You had flesh and sinews attached to those bones, but no life per se, no breath. And then prophesy for the breath, and here comes the breath, and they're alive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a very good illustration, we are body and soul. We dare not separate the two, okay? God does not separate the two except for in the formation showing us, yes, we're the body, and yes, we're the soul. Uh, it both are important and we could spend more time about that uh, later, but I'm running out of time right now. So I just want to show that there's a beautiful connection between body and soul. And so take care of the body, uh, take care of the soul where it fits in with, um, uh, uh, Paul here, just as a little summary, why I went that way. Paul used a very physical illustration of running to describe the discipline for the soul. Um, and I'm not going to let that go and say we should not take care of the body that God has entrusted to us. It is a gift from God. Uh, and we have the freedom to take care of the body and we have the freedom to neglect the body. Okay, so I don't want to sit there and say only thin people go to heaven. No, I'm not saying that. Okay, um, because uh, we all have different issues and different struggles, but take care what God has given you, both body and your soul. But let's uh, close uh, with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.